Hello, I'm Ron Davis. I'd like to talk to you about some recent work that's being done here at Stanford University on the research for MECFS. Some of this work has been supported by the Open Medicine Foundation, which is, for us has been an absolute critical uh, to getting this research done. Our approach really for, for doing this research, we, what, what we call fast tracking, uh, that is we want to find a cure for this disease. And uh, our goal is to find a cure, not uh, just find uh, data that we can publish. And so this whole thing is being driven by collecting lots of data, analyzing that data, and, and moving on. Uh, it's, it's not heavily controlled by hypothesis testing. Uh, we are not doing large numbers of patients to keep the cost down, but we feel that we can, in fact, understand this disease by only using a small number of patients. Uh, what we're looking for is a signature in this disease. Uh, some of these are going to be biomarkers. Uh, and we really also focus on trying to get very high quality data um, and also follow this over a course of time. Uh, one of the things that we're really good at is developing new diagnostic, diagnostic technology, and I'm going to talk to you about some of those uh, in, this, in this talk. Uh, we also want to tech, develop a technology that will allow us to do drug screening. Currently, we're, we're uh, restricted by doing drugs on patients, and uh, that's slow and uh, costly, uh, and, and, and it's going to take us a long time to actually figure something out. So what I'm going to show you is a technology that we think we can probably use in high-throughput drug screening. Uh, also, uh, it's likely that this technology will be applicable to other diseases like Lyme's disease, fibromyalgia, and so forth. Now the goals of the Stanford Genome Technology Center is to develop innovative technologies to cut healthcare costs. Uh, we have found that this is, that does not appear to be a very high priority for NIH, which I'm surprised at. However, uh, private donations have helped us a lot in developing this. Uh, one of our focuses is on developing uh, uh, engineered biosensors and other devices. Uh, we also have a synthetic biology uh, core that is used to develop new ways to do a production of drugs and novel drugs. So uh, we're trying to take on a whole systems approach for understanding disease and finding a treatment for those diseases. Uh, for the Open Medicine Foundation, we put together an advisory board that will help us on this because this is a complex problem uh, involving medicine and other technologies, and we have experts in a, a variety of fields that will help us do this. And uh, this is a pretty outstanding uh, advisory board, and they've helped us a lot in coming up with ideas and approaches that we can use. Now, let me uh, digress a moment to talk about our big data study. Uh, that has launched uh, some time ago. We're making progress on it. Uh, it's a hard problem because we could only take a small amount of blood from these patients and we only got enough blood to do every test once. We don't have backups. Uh, and we also promised them that we would not uh, go back to them for new blood samples. It's not uncommon for technologies not to work and you have to do a backup. So uh, we're being very careful to make sure everything works before we use the severely ill patients. Uh, we have a lot of data collected on them. Um, uh, uh, have a list of those that we have done. Uh, we're going to continue working uh, on this big data study. But I'll, I'll mention one thing, is that to test out all this, um, we did one patient, that was my son. Uh, in his case, uh, he was okay with us going back and taking a second blood sample. And so we used his blood to test a lot of things. One of the uh, problems that I faced in this is I wrote two grants to NIH. Uh, they were both turned down because we were trying to do discovery. 
and they wanted us to do only hypothesis testing. And as I said to them, uh, the, th the scientific method is first observation, then hypothesis. And if you have virtually no, no observations, you can't generate a good hypothesis. And I think that is one of the big problems about this disease, is we don't know enough at the molecular level to generate good hypotheses. Uh, we analyzed his blood and did a very large number of measurements. Uh, and it, of interest, I, we did the metabolomics. Uh, it was done by Metabolon. Uh, they analyzed the data and sent it to me. It took me about 15 seconds of looking at their list of uh, metabolites, and I said, I understand this disease pretty well now. And that has set us in a direction that I think we're making good progress on. So that it was a discovery, and that discovery was crucial for everything I'm going to be talking about. And it came from the metabolomics. Now we are experts in a lot of different things, and mostly around DNA and RNA. Uh, we will be pursuing those in this uh, big data study. But I want to uh, show you some more something more specifically, uh, let's say in regarding the, the metabolism. So uh, here's a plot that was supplied to us by Metabolon. It has all of the metabolic pathways of the human being. You can't really see it because there's so much data on there. But I've color coded it, and that should help. And the color coding there is um, a blue and red. Blue is a deficiency. Red is a surplus of a particular metabolite. Now these are what's called two standard deviations away from healthy controls. In other words, pretty seriously a problem. And you can see an awful lot of blue and red. Uh, and that's very clear that there's a metabolic problem going on. You can also see an awful lot more blue than red. Uh, and that means that there's a lot of things that are low, or it's a hypometabolic disease. That was the, that's what I could see in the first 15 seconds. So if you, you can look uh, into the, all the metabolic cycles and, and, and learn a lot of detail about this particular patient, but a particular interest is looking at what's called the citric acid cycle. This is the cycle that generates almost all of the energy uh, for, a, for a person. And if you look at that, you realize that there's an awful lot of blue in it. That means uh, the citric acid cycle uh, intermediates are all very, very low. That suggests that this patient cannot generate energy or ATP very well. If we look at a patient that has a mitochondrial defect, you see it all in red. And that means that it accumulates the citric acid cycle because it can't burn them. And so this is a case where it's apparently not able to burn the uh, The, the, the glucose that a person's getting. The fact that the citric acid cycle is low suggests that the pathway leading up to the uh, citric acid cycle uh, intermediates is, is somehow shut down. And, and if we look at that, we say that probably glycolysis is actually shut down. Now, uh, Flugamella suggested that the proved rate dehydrogenase is possibly blocked. Uh, we have not investigated that, but it's certainly consistent with what we think is that glycolysis is shut down. We also think that maybe a pruvate kinase has been shut down. Those are not inconsistent. It's possible that there are blocks in both of them. Uh, and uh, this may be the heart of this disease. Now, um, we have developed a device, uh, and it's a nanofabricated device. And in fact, I have one here in my pocket. I can, this is our new instrument. And uh, here's the instrument. Uh, it's basically like a computer chip. Um, it, it has a small channel in it that we can put a, about uh, a tenth of a drop of blood. And that's all we need for this assay. Uh, it has 2,500... Uh, electrodes in it, uh, and each electrode is sampled a uh, hundred times a second. So it generates a massive amount of data. What we've noticed from this device is if we put a uh, bacterial population into this, uh, we, we will get a certain electrical impedance signal. 
if we then add an antibiotic that kills the bacteria, the, the, the uh, electrical impedance will, uh, will rapidly increase. If the bacteria are resistant to the antibiotic, we see no change. So this is a sort of a metabolic uh, testing device. Uh, we reasoned that maybe the uh, cells from patients might respond similarly. So we, that is something that we have currently been testing. And here's what it looks like. So if we put um, healthy cells in their serum, in the device, uh, it, it pretty, is pretty stable and doesn't change. If we put in uh, MECFS cells in their serum, it doesn't change. However, if we put a demand on the cells, we require them to consume energy. And, uh, and that demand is seen in this graph where there's a slight dip in the healthy controls. But they handle that demand quite well, and, the, and they don't change after that. However, the, the cells from the MECFS patient show a rapid increase in, uh, in impedance. And that's been shown for every uh, patient we've looked at, and also every healthy control has been the same. Now, how, uh, here's how we plan to use this. This can be a way to track down what is going on. And uh, so what we, the first experiment was to do a serum switch. If we take uh, the serum from a healthy control and put it on the CFS cells, they look healthy. If we take serum from a CFS patient and put it on healthy cells, they look like any CFS cells. In other words, the information that causes this rapid rise in impedance is in the serum, not the cell. And that was quite surprising and also good news because it means there's something that's being released into the serum that's causing a lot of the effects. If it's in the serum, we probably can find it. And so that's what we're trying to do now is to find out what is the component or components, and it's most likely plural, uh, is causing this effect. And that's, that's the uh, intense uh, effort that we're currently using. We have some good ideas, and we're now, uh, now this is a good hypothesis, and we're now testing those. But more importantly, this provides us with an assay for a drug. In other words, if we take MECFS cells and serum, or just healthy cells and CFS serum, and we add a compound that blocks this process, uh, we can test that. And we can probably set this up into some form of high throughput assay. Now, we've already found a couple of things that do this. Unfortunately, they're not going to be useful drugs. Uh, one of those is pyruvate. If we throw in pyruvate uh, into a situation which would show the increase in impedance, it doesn't happen. In other words, it would appear that pyruvate itself can cure the problem. Now, that could be because uh, the pruvate enters into it after the block, or it could be that it, the pruvate is actually inhibiting something. We don't know the answer. We've also found that if you add ATP, the cells become normal. Well, that might not also be surprising because one of the problems is lack of ATP, possibly. So this is a kind of a good, a good initial testing that uh, indicates that this may be a good approach. So the, the next stage is trying to find a, a, a number of drugs uh, that might uh, help us in solving this problem. Now we actually also plan to test all the things out there that people have found in the past, like Valcite appears to help. Now it's an antiviral, but maybe it does something else. Uh, rituximab has been shown to be effective. Well, maybe the antibody reacts with something else. So th those will be tested in this system. Um, now, this is a very uh, cheap and it's real-time assay. So uh, uh, we are also looking to maybe even uh, increase the throughput on this instrument so that we can do massive uh, drug screening.
Now, with this system, it, it, I don't think it's necessarily valuable for patients at this stage to know what their answer is. Certainly not until we do quite a bit more work. Uh, now, what we are looking at is patients that have been clearly diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, and then we look for the signal. I don't think at this stage it would be useful for patients to know what their response is. Uh, if it turns out that this is a good uh, diagnostic test, and it could be, uh, then we will try to figure out a way to disseminate that uh, into the doctor's office. Uh, it, it, you can see that this we can probably put this into a handheld device. Um, uh, we have another device that we've developed, which is called magnetic levitation, uh, which separates out cells based on their uh, magnetic uh, pro uh, properties. And uh, that's being used currently to, to isolate kind of tumor cells from uh, cancer patients uh, and also then profile them. Uh, we have some unique signatures uh, that we've seen with this device also from uh, ME-CFS patients. Uh, and and uh, we're trying to actually combine both of these technologies. So the magnetic levitation is a little device that fits onto an iPhone. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, the cost is around five cents per assay. Uh, we have a uh, another new technology that uses an inkjet printer to make the devices. Uh, those devices can be made for about one cent. So we've had a heavy focus on how to reduce cost of tests uh, and simplicity of those tests and exportability of those tests. So we're very optimistic that we can in fact find some inhibitor uh, we're now accumulating a list of things that we have to try in this device. Uh, we're hoping to find something that will maybe block the signals that we're seeing in the serum and, and, and actually make patients uh, feel better. It also may uh, allow us to find a cure. Thank you very much. We can make this research go much faster if we could hire additional people. This requires additional funding. Please donate to the Open Medicine Foundation to make this research go faster. Thank you.